Okay, so Chris finished with a thank you, and I'm going to start with a thank you um, in one minute. I'll just say, I mean, it is an honor for me to be the spokesperson for the HPCD Imaging Protocol. Uh, as you saw in Chris's slides, there are lots and lots of people, many of who, their, their names you'll never hear, working away in the background to make this protocol work for us. So it's a genuine, genuinely, it's an honor for me to just be a spokesperson and try to convey to you the product of all the work that they've been doing for years, actually, to get this study up and running. There we go. Okay, actually, I'm just going to go back because I want to mention at least a few names. Yeah, so just, just a few people at the bottom there who are particularly... Um, particularly, particularly helpful for the content of today's presentation. I'll give you that reference at the end of the paper again. So the HPCD imaging protocol, so, you know, it's a challenge, right? I mean, if you stop and think about it, it's a variety of scanners. There's going to be scanner upgrades. We have to, have to future-proof the study over the next 10, 12 years. We need to acquire high-quality data. We need to get it quickly, because these are infants and toddlers and children. Um, and there are a whole bunch of interesting conceptual and uh, technical challenges given the rapid neurodevelopmental changes that happen over the first uh, few years of life. So uh, the neuroimaging group has actually uh, split itself into five, rather seven, uh, different uh, working groups. Uh, the first five there are sp focused specifically, you know, this is with expertise on the different domains, the different modalities, and I'll kind of walk you through those protocols. There is a subgroup that's, that works on just on the processing of the data and the making available of it to, to you all. And then also a working group that just works on the development of optimal procedures and protocols and standardized harmonization for the acquisition. Again, across multiple sites, this has to be done in a very rigorous uh, way. And there are you know, some uh, tremendous expertise in the consortium, so we have to help that expertise spread out to all the sites who are collecting data. Um, a lot of guidance from recent large-scale neuroimaging studies, a lot of piloting over the last couple of years to develop this protocol. Um, there are many novel imaging features that I'll just uh, flag a couple here, but there really are quite a few. But ones that, for now, real-time motion estimation, so for structure, function, and the diffusion imaging, so you can know as you are acquiring the data if it will pass quality. So maybe if there's the option, you can collect more data. Um, compressed sensing for faster acquisition across a number of protocols, and a lot of work done on the spectroscopy sequence to obtain additional metabolites with even an ever shorter acquisition time, and I'll walk you through some of those details as we go along. Okay, um, so let's just start with the structure. Right. The, the, it's a bit wordy, my, uh, my slides. I'm just sort of going to put this up there, so if you care about some of the specific details, it's there for you, but I'm not necessarily going to read through everything. Um, I will just flag for the structural MRI that, you know, it's, it's quite an achievement to be able to obtain the T1 and the T2 weighted scans in just seven minutes, and it's fairly high spatial resolution. The reason being the logic is we wanted to keep the acquisition the same across time, so to be suitable for a one-day-old and ultimately for a 10-year-old, so 0.8 millimeter uh, resolution uh, voxels. There are navigators for perspective motion detection, and of course all of this stuff has to be done to be suitable and optimized across vendors. Um, the T1 scans will, for those of you who work in this space, will, uh, you, you, you're well aware that the contrast changes over time, especially in those first couple of years of life. So the morphometry analysis we based largely on the T2s and in the first couple of years of life and then transition to the T1s. Um, just to give you, maybe, um, a sense of the data. It, it's a pretty ugly picture. I promise you the data are, are better than my ugly screenshot, okay? Um, but I just wanted to show you that the, the, the data core are already processing the data as part of our kind of QC process, make sure that everything is, is working. Um, it seems to be this is pilot data, or sorry, sorry, rather preliminary analysis on about 170 participants. The sort of things that we are looking for as, you know, are the measurements, are they sensible? Are we seeing growth curves that we would expect? Uh, is th are there any apparent vendor differences? Is there variability across participants to enable the sort of individual difference analyses that we will be doing? So we just have here uh, plotted some, uh, uh, just some graphs showing uh, age as a function, uh, sorry, the, the gray matter, uh, cerebral cortex volumes, white matter volumes as a function of age in this first 170 or so participants. Obviously, it's segmented, so we can do this for different regions of interest. So again, quality control for right now. Everything seems to be looking really good. The data seems to be high quality. The processing seems to be working very well. All our QC procedures seem to be uh, working effectively. There is a resting state acquisition. Again, some of the uh, acquisition details up there on screen for you. Uh, 
similar sort of story, preliminary analysis with 171 participants, again, is showing uh, good quality data, uh, networks of interest, um, connectivity measures, as you'd expect, seed-based connectivity analysis have been run. Everything seems to be looking good. Um, as you can see, there are two seven and a half minute uh, bold runs, two millimeters isotropic resolution for the, uh, for the voxels. I'm going to pause because I tend to talk too quickly, so I'll let you stare upon the data for one more second. Okay, um, diffusion imaging. Um, so a 12 and a half minute acquisition for the diffusion imaging. You'll see the, the details there on the, um, on the multi-shell parameters uh, on the voxel sides. A uh, lot of data processing has already happened. Multiple, multiple models have been fit to the data. Uh, you see there are some summary stats for about 700 scans. So we have voxel-wide scalar values. We've already been able to generate track-based analyses. All these data, just to, you'll hear more about this later, but you know, raw data, minimally processed data, fully processed tabulated data will all be available in the data releases to the entire scientific community. So we're hoping part of showing you this is to kind of stoke up your enthusiasm and your interest in the study, and hopefully you can be in the first wave of people who start doing these analyses on what has already become, with over a thousand participants, one of the largest, uh, you know, pediatric uh, cohorts. Okay, quantitative MRI. As you know, the T1, T2 weighted scans can be very sensitive to things like participant placement, hardware, software, and in the pediatric population, this is particularly challenging. One of the challenges here is that the very thing we measure changes over the time. The T1, the T2 uh, contrast due to changes in myelination, free water diffusion. So you can address that to some extent with actual you know, measurement of the T1 and the T2. So there is a quantitative MR protocol included. Uh, there's some just in initial analyses, again, suggesting that the data are looking good. Again, just to reiterate, you know, we're looking for now for, you know, any possible vendor effects that we need to address. Are we seeing growth curves as expected? Are the data surviving all our QC processes? And again, the story thus far seems that everything is going well. The data are looking good across our multiple, multiple data acquisition sites. Okay. Uh, uh, MR spectroscopy is included in the protocol. And you'll see there the key metabolites of interest. Uh, NAA, GABA, uh, gl glutathione, and then also, and again, a lot of work has been done by this group to be able to get measurements of a whole number of additional metabolites. The acquisition here is going to be a single voxel localized in the uh, thalamus, and all of these data can be obtained in about nine minutes, and that will hold constant over the duration of the study, over its, um, its many, many years. Uh, and then again, just some initial analysis showing you the data Again, you know, what's exciting for us is to see that as well as there being kind of orderly developmental changes, that there's interesting levels of individual differences in these measures, which of course will enable all the sorts of individual differences, questions that one might want to ask about in utero exposures, early life uh, experiences, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then finally, um, and I thought I was gonna go long. Uh, the, but this is good because this leaves us more time for questions afterwards. We have an EEG uh, protocol. You'll see the four tasks there at the bottom. So there's a FACES task. So obviously social processing, face processing is of, of particular interest. An auditory oddball task relevant for you know, uh, subsequent language development. A resting state um, and visual evoked potential task. So all these tasks have been carefully chosen because they show interesting uh, longitudinal, uh, you know, in neurodevelopmental trajectories and have been linked to all sorts of interesting subsequent outcomes in terms of you know, cognitive and social development. Um, again, just some quick analyses to show you that the data seem to be very, very orderly. We're seeing here robust visually evoked potentials. Um, we're seeing robust mismatch negativity uh, as, as signals as well. In a preliminary analysis, they're showing for about 70 participants of the phase processing task. Again, I'm not going into any of the details. These are preliminary. These are to whet your appetite, not to give you a data presentation. And then finally, you'll see there's the uh, um, power spectrum distribution data across all the electrodes. So this is our protocol. You're going to be seeing and hearing lots more of it as the study progresses. 
Um, again, I want to thank particularly um, Douglas Dean and colleagues. There is a paper that uh, will hopefully be uh, uh, published very shortly in Development and Cognitive Neuroscience, and it gives you much more details on all aspects of the acquisition protocol and the rationale and all the pilot work and the preliminary work that went into deciding the specifics of the particular acquisitions and information on the data analysis. So that will hopefully be a great resource for all of you, as well as all the information that will accompany the data releases. So hopefully you're enthused. Thank you very much. I